All right, so we're going to talk about colorings today, colorings of graphs. So we have a, kind of a, a litany of definitions here. They're all pretty basic, though. So a proper coloring um, of a graph, G, is an assignment. So what's an assignment? It's just a function, right? It's just we're using different terms here of distinct labels, just we call them colors. It's defining color simultaneously here um, to the vertices of G such that adjacent vertices get different colors. So the endpoints of an edge are different colors, so they're not the same. Okay. Uh, adjacent vertices get different colors. Okay. So usually the colors themselves are just, we use uh, integers one up to K or whatever, like, so like a, a proper coloring of the triangle, I actually don't have a whole lot of choices here. All the vertices have to be different colors because all pairs of vertices are, are joined to each other. Um, but maybe a C4 here, you can color a little bit better. One, two, one, two works. Although there are other colorings, right? You can rotate that coloring, but you can also use more colors than sort of needed. Right, this one works as well. This used a third color that was somehow unnecessary because we showed one with like fewer colors. And this will be exactly the question we address is what's the minimum, right? How can we keep the number of colors down? Okay. And uh, let me emphasize a few things. So some books will define proper a, a coloring separately and then a proper coloring is a type of coloring. So coloring is just an assignment of colors to the vertices with no rules whatsoever. Like it's just a labeling, it's just a map. Um, sometimes it's worth talking about those things on their own. And then a coloring is proper. That gives this part here that adjacent vertices get different colors. This is the proper. That's the proper property. And the coloring is just the assignment. OK, so we can talk about a non proper or a not necessarily proper coloring or just a coloring. But 99% of the time, if I talk about coloring a graph, I will mean a proper coloring of the graph. Right. So I won't always say proper coloring. Just keep that in mind. <clears throat> OK. So um, a graph is K colorable, oops, if it has a proper coloring using at most K colors. So if it has a proper coloring with at most K colors, okay? So you've got a palette of K colors. And if you can get away with a proper coloring of the graph with using no more than K of those, then the graph is K colorable. And this property is monotone. If you're 10 colorable, then you're 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 colorable, right? Once I've given you a nice coloring with 10 colors, if I allow you to use 11 or 12 or 13 or more, it's you, you don't have to use all colors. They don't have to appear, right? Um, so if we like look at these examples here, once I draw in an evidence here with something using colors, this is definitely three colorable because I've produced one with three colors. This is two colorable. And it's, this proves that it's three colorable, but once we knew it was two colorable, it already proved it was three colorable, right? So this, this didn't give us new information here. And really in a way, what's more interesting is what values of K are it not colorable, K colorable anymore, right? For instance, this triangle is not two colorable. Right, you can't get away with just two colors on the triangle here. If you do, you'll see that you know some color is repeated by the pigeonhole principle, and then there's two edges. I mean, there's two vertices joined by an edge that have the same color. Color, okay? The same, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> okay, and so that value, that minimum k, that's what's called the chromatic number of a graph. So that's the parameter for the for a graph. Okay, so the chromatic number, chromatic number. Uh, chi, it's a chi, a Greek letter chi of G uh, is, uh, so chromatic number chi of G of G is minimum K such that G is K colorable. Okay. We'll also say if, if the chromatic number is K that G is K chromatic, right? That's, that's just another way of describing it here. <clears throat> okay, so let me let's draw a couple examples. 
the, there's some nice pictures in the notes that show the minimums for uh, graphs with two, three, four, and five. Uh, make sure you take a look at those. I'll, I'll just repeat a couple of them real quick here. So like a complete bipartite graph, so K33. So we saw this one a bunch in the planarity chapter. This one's too colorable, right? I can color all these the same color. There's no edge among the ones. And I can call the, color these all the same color. There's no edge among the twos. Um, there are edges across, so that doesn't matter, right? They're definitely going to go between different colors here. So this is too colorable. And actually, you can easily check that the chromatic number of K33 is indeed exactly two, because there's no way you can get away with one color. In general, you're always going to need more than one color as long as you have an edge. As soon as you have an edge, you need two colors for that edge alone. Um, if there's no edges, then chromatic number is one, all right? So the, the empty graph in terms of edges is the only graph with chromatic number one. And actually, more generally, a bipartite graph will clearly have chromatic number two. Color all the vertices on one side one color, all the vertices on the other side one color. There are no edges inside of the class, so you're safe. And in fact, if you think about what, what, what I'm saying here, the edges, the vertices of a single color form an independent set, right? There's no edge inside of what we call a color class. Let me actually state what that is. That. So all vertices of a single color are a what we call color class, right? So the vertices of color one, that's color class one, color class two. Sometimes we say the red color class, the blue color class. Um, and let me make this easy observation real quick here that color classes are independent sets. Right. Independent sets are sets of vertices with no edges among them. That's necessary by the definition of coloring. Right? No edge sees the same color on both ends. No vertex is adjacent um, to a ver vertex of the same color. So there can be no edge inside of a color class. So the color classes themselves are independent sets. This, this is a helpful observation in a little bit. Um, maybe let's look at another example or two here. So say we take this odd cycle and say, okay, definitely not one colorable. Is it two colorable? Well, no, and actually we thought about this earlier in the class, not with colorings, but with bipartiteness, which is, which is you know, equivalent. We tried like say, you know, class A, class B, class A, class B, hey, that can't be in class A or B, right? Or if you tried to color it, and this is a common strategy here, let's try and find the minimum number of colors. Well, colors are permutable, right? If I've produced a coloring with chi many colors, Color class one, I can switch colors one and two, right? You can, like it'll be the same coloring essentially. So there's definitely a vertex of color one. Say it's this one at the top. This thing's totally symmetric, so it makes no difference. And then say, well, what's this? It's something other than one. Let's just assume it's two. I'm trying to keep the number of colors down. This would have to be one then, unless I introduce a third color. This would have to be two. And then I get stuck in the same problem here. This can't be one or two, so it's gotta be three. So I produced here a, a, a graph, a three coloring of the, odd cycle. And in, in doing that, I also sort of, sort of, sort of evidenced that um, two colors wasn't going to work as well. Okay, So the chromatic number of the C5, or more generally, an odd cycle is three. Right? You can make the same argument for a longer odd cycle as well. Okay, You can't go below that. All right, And then maybe one final example here. Um, take a complete graph. So take K5. How many colors am I going to need for this graph? N. Yeah, one, exactly. One, and in general, one for every vertex. As soon as I choose color one here, it's not appearing again because everything's joined to everything. So the chromatic number of a KN is N. Every vertex needs a different color. Right? There's never a reason to use more than N colors, right? A chromatic number is always bounded above by the number of vertices. Right? So actually, that answers an initial, although trivial, question Do graphs have a finite chromatic number? And yeah, if they're finite, yes, you just use one color per vertex and you'll definitely have an upper bound of the chromatic number. Pretty simple. Okay, so let's prove some theorems about the chromatic number. And the first theorem, um, we could have proved this earlier in the class, but G is too colorable. Um, colorable. In other words, bipartite. 
right? Being bipartite and being too colorable are equivalent to each other, right? A bipartition of a graph is splitting it up into two classes so that no edge is inside of a class, so that all edges go between the two classes. Um, that's too colorable. That's saying, oh, class one is color one, class two is color two. That's the, the, the equivalent notions here. If and only if um, G contains no odd cycle subgraph. Okay. So we saw a moment ago that odd cycles um, were not too colorable. And we learned very early on in the class that odd cycles were not bipartite, equivalent observation. But actually, this necessary condition is sufficient. Like avoiding odd cycles is all you need to do. There's no other thing in your graph that can allow you to become bipartite. So if you're not bipartite, there's definitely an odd cycle in your graph. Okay, this, this is actually a really handy fact. And I just put it to the colorability chapter. So we'll use it. We'll use the notion of colors here, but it's the same as bipartiteness. Um, let me mention one thing here. So two colorable means it can be colored with two colors or potentially fewer, right? If you're two colorable, maybe you're one colorable, right? So this does allow for the graph, like we do consider uh, graphs with no edges to be bipartite, right? Formally, like if you have no edges, then you can partition the vertices into two classes such that no edge goes across, right? Vacously, it's true. Um, so we say two colorable instead of two chromatic, right? Because a graph with no vertices is two colorable. In fact, it's one colorable. And it also contains no odd cycle subgraph, okay? It's not that important though. Um, this is actually was, we were having a debate about this. I just got a referee's report back about a paper of mine. And they pointed out that the theorem's not true because like, if you look at the empty graph, it doesn't, you know, it actually doesn't satisfy the conclusion of the theorem. It's like, okay, true, you know, okay, we have to make it clear that we're only interested in graphs with edges in them, which is, you know, like, that, I mean, it's okay. You should, you should be pre precise, but usually, you know, like it's, it's, yeah, it's, Actually, there's a there's a famous quote. It says, uh, "Well, okay, it's not about the graph empty of edges. It's about the graph with no vertices. Like you can also define the graph with no vertices, right? The empty graph." And uh, there's there's a quote. Maybe it's by Fothal that says, "It does is the pointless graph pointless." I think that's how it's stated. Something like this, right? Does it make sense, right? Like, is there even a reason to like ever mention the fact that that is a graph? And I think occasionally it comes up that yes, it's handy to have that notion occasionally, maybe for some weird induction or something. But. But the null graph, or the graph with no edges, uh, depending on your terminology, that's definitely useful, right? You just you do sometimes have to throw it out of your uh, hypotheses. Okay, so how do we prove this? All right, so forward direction is very simple, just the contrapositive here. Um, if you have an odd cycle, then you're not bipartite, right? That's the contrapositive of, of, of the forward direction. Um, if G has an odd cycle, then G is not too colorable, okay? And well, why exactly? Let's just, let's this, this, I mean, maybe this is obvious, but this clarifies an important point here. G has an odd cycle subgraph. Odd cycles cannot be colored with two colors. So G itself can't be colored with two colors because if it could, then somewhere along the way, I two colored the, the, the odd cycle that was contained in it, okay? So this, this chromatic number is also monotone in terms of subgraphs. If I have a subgraph that takes 10 colors, then my whole graph takes at least 10 colors, right? Because I've got to color the subgraph along the way, right? So this is a handy thing for finding, hey, what's my chromatic number? Well, maybe I have a really large complete graph contained inside my graph, then I need at least that many colors. I might need even more, but that thing definitely pushes me up to begin with, okay? So th that's, that's why here. So, th I mean, I'm not gonna write it out, but because you have an odd cycle, you need at least three colors to do all, all regardless of what else is there. Okay, so the forward direction is easy. We kind of already knew that anyway. Now the reverse, let's suppose that G has no odd cycle and let me produce for you a two coloring, okay? So suppose G has no odd cycle, right, subgraph. Okay, and then we want to show G is two colorable and I'll produce the two coloring for you. Okay, so first thing we're gonna observe, and this is another important observation for chromatic number, is it's enough to color the graph component-wise. So look at a connected component, color that, and just do it for each of them individually. 
coloring one component has no impact on another component, right? There's no edges between components. So if I can color this component with seven colors and the next one with three, then the one of seven was all I really cared about, right? So what that allows us to do is we can just assume G is connected when we're trying to find its chromatic number because like whichever component pushes the chromatic number up is the only thing you have to focus on. Um, but for now, we'll just say, I'm just gonna color each of the components, but let H be any component of G. Okay, so we're just gonna show how to color H. Um, yeah, okay, I'm um, lost here. Yeah, so we're gonna show that H is two colorable, which completes the theorem because it means every component is two colorable. Therefore, I only need two colors for the graph. Yeah, one thing uh, maybe worth mentioning yet again is the permutation of colors is important that you can do that, right? If I color H with colors red and blue, and then color another component with green and yellow, like that was unnecessary. I could replace green and yellow in the second component with red and blue that was in the first component, just something to keep in mind. Okay, all right, so we have a component and uh, UV is an edge, just an arbitrary edge of H. All right. Um, Okay, maybe I didn't, oh yeah, I, sorry. Let me get one other thing before it. I don't wanna pick any old UV, there's one thing. Okay, H is a component, H is connected. Let's let T be a spanning sub, uh, spanning tree, sorry, of H, okay? So this is why we need connectedness. I need to use the spanning tree, all right? So I've got H, it's got a spanning tree uh, because it's connected and then let UV be an arbitrary edge in the spanning tree. So it's one, it's, it is one of the edges in, in H. Maybe I can write this if I want. Okay. okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna color, wait, what am I saying? What, what are you, no, uh, dang it. I wanna choose an arbitrary vertex, not edge, sorry, sorry. Arbitrary vertex. Let U be, yeah, let's just do this. Let V, be an arbitrary vertex, vertex of T, okay. Now I'm gonna color the vertices of T, which are the same as the vertices of H, right? Uh, yeah, so this, this is actually equality here, right? The vertices of a spanning tree are all the vertices of H, okay? Uh, by their distance, I'll explain this, from V. So what is distance? I don't think we've defined this in the class, but the distance from a vertex V is the length of a shortest path from V to that vertex there, okay? So color the, the vertices say U of V by their distance from, from V. And what is distance? This is length of shortest uh, UV path okay, in T, right? And that's very easy to compute in a tree. In trees, the UV paths are unique. So like, you know, you have to worry about shortest, just find how far away it is, right? Find the number of edges you need to get from V to U. And we're gonna use that information to color somehow. And how are we gonna color by distance? We're gonna color based on whether it's an odd distance or an even distance, okay? Vertices at odd distance are red, vertices at blue distance are color blue. And again, because, well, shortest distance is well-defined, but certainly because we're in a tree, this is unique. Right, like the color, I'm not gonna, vertex won't get color red and blue because the shortest is either of odd length or of even length, right, the shortest, okay. Um, so vertex U is red if distance even and uh, blue if distance is odd, right, otherwise. Okay, so that's the two coloring of T, <laughs> okay. Um, so first observe, this is proper coloring of T, right? This is immediate, but maybe it's worth, worth stating here. Like if you look at an edge here, the two end vertices can't get the same color because if the distance to th this vertex um, made this one red, so it was odd, the distance to this guy here couldn't be odd as well. And this is relying on the fact that it's a tree. The path here, to this vertex either travels through this odd one and is one longer, or the distance to this one travels through this one and it's one shorter. But this, the distance to here is either one more or one less from V. So this has to be even. And so they'd get, uh, what did I say? Even was red, so this would be red and this would be blue. Okay, so 
It's a proper coloring of T. The question is, is it a proper coloring of H? Because H has additional edges. Okay. So let's question, is this a proper coloring of H? Okay. Right. So when I add back in the edges, do I still maintain the property that there's no there's no monochromatic edge? Sometimes we say there's no edge with red vertices on both ends or blue vertices on both ends. So suppose not. Um, I.e., there is a an edge. Let's even say a red edge. U uh, no, X Y. Okay. Is it clear what I mean? The edge itself isn't colored, although we will talk about coloring edges later. But I mean that X, Y are both uh, red. Okay. So, like the two end vertices in H. Now, we know this is ne never true of vertex in T, which is inside of H, but there might be some other edge. Okay. Now, what happens uh, when I look at this graph? The spanning tree T plus the edge X, Y which is necessarily not in T because T doesn't have, doesn't fail to be colored properly, but H might, I can add this edge to T and what happens? I mean, this should be very familiar. What happens when you add an edge to a tree, you get a cycle, right? So uh, this has a cycle C. And I claim that C has odd length, which is a contradiction. Okay, let's look at the cycle real quick. That cycle contains edge X and Y and then it contains some other edges that are all in T. This is red and this is red. This is necessarily blue. All the other edges are in T, so they obey that they don't have the same color on both ends. So red, blue, red, blue, and so on and so forth. And then eventually blue here. And if you check the parity of this cycle here, I alternate red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, and then one more red at the end. This cycle has odd length. So of odd length. So H has a subgraph of odd length, uh, an odd cycle subgraph of odd length. That's a contradiction, right? G has no odd cycles in it. That was the starting assumption. So this coloring of the, uh, um, the spanning tree of H or of our graph, say if our graph's connected, based on distance actually colored the entire thing. Otherwise you got an odd cycle. So that's the end of the proof. Right. It's a cool one. There are other ways to prove this. Uh, this is one I like a lot. Okay. Okay, so that now we have a, a nice characterization of bipartite graphs or of two colorable graphs, right? Two colorable graphs are two colorable if and only if they have an odd cycle. That's the only thing that we need to check for. Um, and it turns out that that's not difficult to check for, although looking for whether a graph has an odd cycle or not, like by brute force, is not that easy, right? You have to look at vertex subsets and check if there's an odd cycle in there, like it, it could be intensive. Turns out checking whether you have an odd cycle or not can be done in polynomial time. It can be done quickly. Checking whether or not you're three colorable is NP complete. So three chromatic, three colorable colorability and beyond is very challenging. That's difficult to solve computationally. At least you know that we don't know of a fast way to do it. Okay. So we're for three colorability and beyond, we're not going to have an if and only if type theorem that oh you're seven colorable if and only if this some forbidden substructure. We're we're unlikely to have a theorem of that type. And so what we will have is is bounds saying okay here's G. The chromatic number is always at least this and always at most this or things like that. And the next couple of lectures are going to be talking about bounds of those types there. Okay, so let's first start off with a theorem with very basic lower bounds. Okay, so lower bounds. So chromatic number lower bounds. Okay, so let's let G be a graph. Then we have the following lower bounds. And the first one I'm gonna to have to define for you what I'm talking about, although we've already actually stated this one. So the chromatic number of G is at least this little omega of G here. So what is that thing there? What, what is that parameter? This thing records the size of the largest complete graph in G. Okay, it's just a parameter measuring that. If you, know, if you have a K10 inside your graph, then this is 10. Right? So, so size, number of vertices, in largest uh, clique in G. Have I used the term clique? 
Clique is, no? Okay, so this is, clique is a, sh a different term for a complete, complete graph. Just clique is a complete graph, right? Reasonable notion. There's a, there's like a whole French school of terminology in graph theory, and they, they call, they use clique more often than they use complete graph. Um, they call an independent set a stable set. You guys may have heard if you've taken Mark class, Mark prefers stable set, or you often use a stable set. And there's a few other like, terminologies. I mean, they're both in use. It's, it's good to be aware of them. Um, clique, I, I like very much. I mean, shorter than complete graph, but um, I, I'll, I'll actually explain how I use these. When I say complete graph, I'm usually referring to the KN, the complete graph. When I'm talking about the existence of a complete graph inside of a graph as a subgraph, I'll often use the term clique. Like just, I mean, it's, they're no different. It's just a kind of a preference. And actually this quantity here sometimes is called the clique number. Right, that, that records the size of the largest number of clique. So clique number, which is a better terminology than saying like the complete graph number, right? That would maybe it doesn't flow as nicely. Okay, so this lower bound is immediate. We actually already discussed it before. If I have a clique of size clique number, then I need at least one color for each of the vertices of those. So my chromatic number is not lower. It might be much higher. Actually, we'll find out it can be way higher, but it's definitely not smaller. Okay, so that's one. The other bound that's a little more interesting is that the chromatic number of G is at least the number of vertices of G divided by the independence number of G, okay? I think we've used this one, but let's remind real quick here. Alpha of G is size of largest independent set, right? So alpha of G is the largest set you can find with no edges among them. Actually, if you think about this, the clique number and the independence number are closely related, right? The independence number is the clique number of the complement of the graph, right? What's the complement of an independent set? It's a complete graph. It's the graph with all edges between them. So the two are connected to each other. And actually, uh, maybe you can, I don't know if these, you can be, I don't think you can argue these directly via com complements. I don't know, it doesn't matter. This one requires actually a proof. So let me, let me just try and write it here, whoops. Thank you, Dropbox, for telling me my space is almost full. <laughs> I, need, I need to upgrade. <laughs> OK. Um, so how do we prove this bound here? OK. Let's make the following observation. So every color class is an independent set, right? Right? So the number of vertices in an independent set is bounded above by chi of g, right? So number of vertices in a color class is it most, whoops, is it most alpha of G, right? You can't have more than alpha of G vertices in, an, in, a, in a color class because the color classes are independent sets. And in a proper coloring of G, we use at most chi of G colors. So I have chi of G different color classes. Each color class has at most chi of G vertices in it. So the total number of vertices isn't larger than the product of these two things, right? If I give you a proper coloring of my graph, each vertex gets a color, they're chi colors, and each color has at most alpha vertices in it. So the number of vertices can't exceed chi g, alpha g. And you just solve this and you get a lower bound on chi of g, just divide both sides by alpha of g, okay? Super, super simple bounds. Okay, let's give sort of uh, an equivalently simple upper bound. Oh, we're doing great on time. Fantastic. I thought, I thought we wouldn't get through this. Okay. Um, all right. Theorem. So now I'll give two upper bounds. And this first upper bound is what's called the greedy bound. And uh, the next couple of lectures, we'll sort of work on trying to improve this bound here. Okay. So let G uh, be a graph with max degree delta of G. This is the usual notation, right? We've used this a couple of times for the maximum degree. Okay. Then you never need to use more than delta of G plus one colors. All right, so here's a nice concrete upper bound depending on another parameter. Your maximum degree is delta G, then the number, the number of colors you need to properly color the graph is at most delta G plus one. 
And this is called the greedy bound because the proof is a greedy argument. What does that mean? It means it's the simplest algorithm you can imagine. Just try to color the graph, like literally drawn on a paper and start trying and just don't introduce colors if you don't need to, okay? So let me say like color vertices of G one by one. So just take some order here, taking care uh, to color a vertex uh, with a color not that appears on its previously colored neighbors. So when I'm coloring color vertex G or X, some of its neighbors have already been colored with whatever colors. Just don't use those colors on the vertex. Either use a color that hasn't hasn't appeared on them or introduce a new color if you must. Okay. So taking care to color a vertex with a color not used on its previously colored neighbors. Okay, so that's the algorithm. So like, uh, I didn't actually have an example for this, but let me try something here. Okay, so say I want to color this graph here. So you just take the vertices in whatever an arbitrary order and start coloring them. So I'm like, okay, great. This vertex is red. And then say I took this vertex next, this is blue. And then I take this vertex down here, this one can be red again, right? Because it wasn't, it's like, that's safe. And then I go, say, uh, here, right? And it's like, oh, that can't be red, so it should be blue. And then say I go down here, this could be blue again. And then this one I go, and it was like, oh, it can't be red or blue because the previously colored neighbors are both colors, so it's got to be green, say something like that, right? So it's very, it's like literally what you would do if you took a paper and tried to do this, you just do the minimum here, okay? Um, and why does this prove that delta G plus one is enough colors? Well, imagine I'm coloring vertex X here. The worst case scenario, the worst that could ever happen is that every edge, every vertex incident to it was already colored, right? Maybe they're all colored and they all got different colors, right? Maybe they got colors one, two, three, all the way up to delta. That could happen. That's the worst thing that can happen when you get to X, right? Nothing worse is possible. And so, if we have delta plus one colors available, then there's a safe color for this one here. I can put delta plus one on that one and be done. So as long as I've got delta plus one, I'm always safe, okay? And actually in general, when I'm at a vertex, as long as I have the degree of that vertex plus one colors in my palette, like I can safely color it. But of course there are vertices of max degree, okay? So this, yeah, uh, so only need delta plus one total colors to be safe, okay? And that proves the theorem, okay? So this is handy. Max degree plus one is always an upper bound on the number of colors. And this proof or this theorem immediately asks, well, okay, can we be like smarter? Because the method by which we chose the colors was simple, like just avoid repeating colors when you can. But the only time this scenario really happens is like if you're really unlucky. Right, like this only is going to happen unless, I mean, unless the, unless you're in a complete graph, right? If you're in a complete graph, you're going to need this many colors, right? So sometimes, yeah, that's worth saying. Sometimes you're going to need this many colors. The complete graph requires n colors, which is the max degree plus one. And so it doesn't matter what you do there. And in fact, yeah. Um, but maybe if I chose the ordering of vertices smarter, I could avoid this sort of troublesome situation that these all got different colors, you know? Maybe some of these could have repeated colors and then X would be safer, okay? So a lot of proving better bounds is actually still coloring with the greedy algor algorithm, but just making better choices about the ordering in which I see the vertices, okay? And actually one of the homeworks you guys will have will be that there's always a, a smart arrangement of the vertices to color the graph with the minimum possible number of colors. Even if you follow the, gre the greedy rule, it's possible, okay? Actually the proof's like one line, but... Uh, you know, it's, it's not hard to figure out what to do, but there are good orderings, okay? You can, this, this, this algorithm, this greedy algorithm of just coloring, avoiding, you know, the previously colored neighbors is actually good. The ordering of vertices is the difficult part. And this is why, not why it's NP complete, but why it's, this isn't gonna lead us quickly to a coloring is there's lots of orderings of the vertices, right? I can run this algorithm on N factorial different orderings and like, that's gonna be slow, right? So one of those will produce the best coloring, but it is slow. 
Okay, so let me give one more bound that's basically an improvement to the one above. Um, and the statement looks a little bit technical, but uh, it's not that hard and it's quite useful um, la later on when we prove some more uh, sophisticated theorems. So let G be a graph. <clears throat> uh, yeah, then, or if G is a graph, the chromatic number of G is at most one plus the maximum over every H, I'm gonna say what that is in a second, of the minimum degree of H, okay? So what's, what are all these things here? That's min degree of H. And what's H here? H is an induced subgraph, okay? So where uh, the max is taken over all induced subgraphs of G, okay? We talked about what an induced subgraph is last time, but what it means is take a vertex subset of G and take all the edges of G that were on that vertex subset, okay? So does induced imply proper subset? Uh, not necessarily, Ethan, but, but that's a good question. So if I'm G, is an induced subgraph of itself because you take all the vertices of G and then all the edges that were present. So you take all of G. So G counts as an induced subgraph of G, but that's the only induced subgraph of G with all the vertices, right? If I drop any edge, then I'll be a subgraph of G, but not induced subgraph of G, right? So actually, if you think about the original, one of the original definitions we gave of subgraph, it was remove vertices and edges and whatever you're left with is a subgraph. And an induced subgraph is just the type where you remove vertices, but never remove an edge, except for those, of course, destroyed automatically by edges, right? But don't pull off an edge unless, it, it, uh, unless it's destroyed by removing a vertex, okay? So for instance, on any set of fixed set of vertices, there's exactly one induced subgraph, right? Fix those vertices, the edges are told to me by G. They're just inherited from G, okay? That's what an induced subgraph looks like, okay? So here we take this max over not every subgraph, but every induced subgraph. So you could actually instead say, take the maximum over every subset of vertices of G and then look at um, the minimum degree of the graph induced on that set of vertices. Sometimes we say that. Okay. So how do we prove this? Well, we do the same algorithm basically, but we have to choose an or a better ordering of the vertices. So the method here will be, how do I find a good ordering of the vertices? All right, so the first things first, let's put K equal to this uh, maximum. Okay, just so I have a, a simpler uh, piece of notation. And indeed this can be done, like, I mean, it's just set, setting equality here, but like this quantity can be computed, right? You can determine the minimum degree of every induced subgraph. There's only finitely many. Find all of them, check the minimum degrees, right? It's something that exists. Yeah. Okay. Um, although again, yeah, yeah. So like as an algorithm that might be costly, but uh, I'm just, I'm just trying to prove the bound here. Right? Um, okay. So now observe that G has a vertex of degree um, at most K. Uh, why is that? Because um, at most k, is that what I want? <laughs> so actually what Ethan said is good here. G itself is a, uh, uh, an induced subgraph. So when I compute the minimum degree of G, it should be, what? Uh, someone help me out here. Why, why do I have vertex of degree in most k? I'm seeing at least k, but I'm confused here. This is the largest minimum over all the things. Um, oh yeah, yeah, because yeah, because this is a maximum, right? So G, so when I plug G into this thing here, it spits out a minimum degree. That minimum degree should not exceed K, otherwise this max would be bigger than K, right? Because when I run, compute all these values, I do compute them on G on one occasion, right? So G definitely has its minimum degrees at most K, otherwise this value would be even higher, right? It could be equal to K, but it's not bigger than K. All right, um, so 
what I'm going to do is remove that vertex. So let's, let's call it a vertex X sub N. That's the name of one of the, maybe multiple vertices. Okay. So now let's put uh, H N minus one equal to G minus X N. So just pluck that vertex off. <laughs> okay. Now notice H N minus one is an induced subgraph of G because I didn't remove edges except for those that were destroyed by pulling off vertex X N. Okay. So as H N minus one is induced, it has a vertex X N minus one of degree at most K. Same reason, right? The minimum degree uh, in H N minus one uh, is bounded above by K. Otherwise this K would be larger here. Now that doesn't mean that X N minus one's degree was K in G. It's just K most K in H N minus one. So after I remove vertex X N, in H n minus one, I found another vertex of degree k in the sub in this subgraph. Okay, and then I can do the same thing. So now put um, H n minus two equal to H n minus one minus X n minus one. H n minus two is an induced subgraph, so it has a vertex of degree two uh, at most k. So pluck that off. Okay, so repeatedly do this. Okay, so repeat until all vertices of G are removed, okay? And this enumerates all the vertices by the order in which they've been removed, right? There's Xn was removed first, then Xn minus one, then Xn minus two, then Xn minus three, until we get to the very end and we remove X1, uh, which would have had degree zero, which is of course the most K as well, okay? And so now we're gonna color uh, X1, X2, X3, up to Xn greedily. <laughs> so we're going to color the vertices of G opposite to the order in which they were removed. Okay, opposite to the order in which they were removed. And when I say I'm going to color them greedily, this gets red and then X2 gets red if it can or blue if it was Jason X1. X3 gets the lowest color it can get based on the number of things it's adjacent to previous and so on and so forth. But observe that each xj, so you know I'm somewhere along the way, and I've got xj here, is adjacent to at most k previous vertices, right? Why is it adjacent to at most k previous vertices? Well, look at this. When I removed xn minus one, it could only be, it, so it could have been adjacent to xn, but the previous vertices that it was adjacent to are all inside of H n minus one, right? And it had degree at most K. So in, in the graph from, from which you're removing it, which is composed of vertices X one up to X J, X J only went to K of those in the, the graph I was removing it from. So it means each one of these guys sends back at most K edges. It might send forward a bunch of edges, okay? But that's not a problem because those aren't colored yet. Right? So even if I have a really high degree, as long as most of my edges are going forward, then it's not an issue. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect the greedy coloring. The greedy coloring only cares about how many previously colored edges there are. Okay? So that means that XJ being only adjacent to K previously colored vertices uh, implies that K plus one colors is enough. Right? Because when I get to XJ, it's got some previously colored neighbors, but at most K of them. So we might see colors one up to K. I can put K plus one on XJ and be safe. And then all the later neighbors here that XJ might be adjacent to, yeah, they're affected by the fact that XJ gets a color, but each of them only has K colors going back. And so they'll be safe. Now, you know, this, in this specific example, this got K plus one. It doesn't mean it gets K plus one. It just sees K plus K of the K plus one. color. Come on. All right, I'm back. I mean, that was the end of the proof anyway, but um, you're right. XJ has a safe color. It's not necessarily, yeah, this is, I just have to, should be a little more illustrative here. In this example, the previously colored vertices that are adjacent to XJ were one up to K, but they might be like one, two, 
four, five, all the way up to k plus one. And then the color free here would be three. It's just that it only sees k of the k plus one colors. So xj is safe. And this later on, this xi is also safe, but for a different reason. It only sends back k, k edges. Okay. So same algorithm, better ordering. And uh, occasionally it'll come up that this quantity here is better to work with. If you think about it for a little while, yes, there are occasions when the value of that maximum is equal to delta, equal to the maximum degree um, for in a complete graph, for instance. But if you draw a few examples of graphs, you'll see that in general, the maximum minimum degree over all induced subgraphs tends to be lower than the ordinary maximum degree of the graph. And all that's saying is, oh, don't color the max degree vertex last because you were asking for trouble. Like if you have a high degree vertex, maybe color it early. Okay, early-ish. It's kind of hard to, hard to determine exactly how to do it. Um, but anyway, okay, so that's it. Uh, that'll do it for the day.